Yeah, yeah, because he, he would call them out. Uh, and it says here that there was a man who had a, a medical condition, a certain man before him which had a condition. Jesus, uh, and I'm going through, if you still got your Bibles open, I'm at the top, and I'm just kind of walking right through this. And it says that Jesus uh, answered uh, the Pharisees and the lawyers and said, now, is it all right, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Because they had a problem with doing anything on the Sabbath day. They, they, they really regarded the Sabbath day as holy, but they had taken things so out of context. And so Jesus said, uh, let me ask you, brothers, is it right to heal on Sunday? Is it right to do something like this on the Sabbath? And, and they held their peace. Nobody said anything. And he took the brother and healed him and let him go. And then he asked this question, and it just makes so much sense in verse 5. Which of you shall have an ass or an ox that falls in a pit and will not right away, straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? If you had an oxen, if you had an animal, and it fell in a hole, even though it was Sunday, you would immediately pull him out of the hole. And they couldn't answer him again to these things, you know, because sometimes Jesus would put a question to them or make a statement, and of course, they could not respond. You know, it was like when the brother came to Jesus and with a coin, they want to trip him up, you know, it was probably around election time too. And uh, they brought the coin to him and, and said, you know, let's see what he's going to say about these taxes. Because, you know, some people had a problem with paying Rome taxes and all of that. I think we can get him on this. Yeah, we'll get him on this. Uh, uh, master, <laughs> is it okay, is it all right to pay taxes to the government, to Caesar? Jesus said, well, bring me one of the coins. And they brought a coin to him. He said, whose image is on this? They said, Caesar. Jesus dismissed him. He said, well, render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar and unto God that which belongs to God. They couldn't say anything. You, know, you, you, can't, you can't argue with that. Uh, there's nothing like they didn't try. You know, they were, they were always trying to trap him. And, 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 and one time they really thought they had him. Any Bible readers in the house? Yeah, they, Jesus was teaching. You can go back and read this. I'm going to stay in Luke, but back in John chapter 8, you can go back and read. Jesus was teaching in the midst of a Bible lesson. And the Pharisees, who you thought would have been where he was teaching, brought a woman to him. They said they had been caught in adultery, caught in the very act. Preachers. Preachers. Brought them to Jesus. How come they weren't in church? How'd they know where to find him? How come they bring a man with him? I'm just saying, you know, I'm just the scripture says that they said that they caught this woman in the very act. I'm married to a strong black woman. It was taught me down through the years that women, when they put their mind to it, they can do anything they want to do. Sometimes they can do it even better than men. But committing adultery is not one thing you can do by yourself. And they thought they had Jesus. He said, we caught in the very act. Now the law says that you are the stone, that she should be stoned. Isn't that something? Aren't you glad you live in the 21st century? I wonder how many hickeys will be upside our heads in the service today. Okay, I'll go on because you act like you didn't catch that. You'll catch it later. They say she should be stoned. But what do you say? Because if Jesus would have said, don't stone her, then they would have said, Deacon Bear, you see, we've been trying to tell y'all, he don't follow the law. But if Jesus said, go ahead and stone her, then they would have said, see, y'all, we've been trying to tell you, this man has no compassion for people. So they thought they really had him. And, and, and what I love about this, this is really another sermon, but let me just throw this in. The Bible says that when they asked him the first time, Jesus just stooped down on the ground and started writing. He didn't even say anything. That, that tells me, I'm about, that tells me some stuff don't even need to be responded to. We keep up a lot of stuff. Some people, and you know, they bring you stuff, and you know it's a mess. You ought to just look at them. And then go But the devil is persistent. You know, you got some folks, they're going to they keep going and going anyway. And, and they kept asking. And Jesus looked at them, and again, he gave my answer that they could not uh, uh, rebuke. 
They could not uh, uh, have a rebuttal to. He said, he who is without sin, throw the first stone. And he went back down on the ground and started writing again. And, and, and the Bible says, beginning with the oldest, they got pricked in their hearts. Conscious started to get to them. By the time Jesus looked up again, she was standing there by herself. And isn't it amazing that the folk that can't condemn you are always willing to condemn you. And the man who can condemn you always wants to give you another chance. Because he said, where are my accusers? She said, there's nobody left. He said, and I won't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. So back in Luke 14, he said to them, you know, uh, which one of you, uh, if you had an ox or, or an ass and it fell into the hole, which one of you wouldn't pull it out on a Sabbath day? And, and again, they could not answer him uh, on these things. And so he said, let me tell you a story. Um, and he tells the story. He says, when you are invited, verse 8, uh -huh. of any man to a wedding, don't go in and sit down in the highest room. Don't take the highest seat, lest a more honorable man than you will come. Uh, and then uh, when he comes, you have been told to go sit down in a lower seat. That, that, that's really what verse 8 and 9 said. Well, let me read it because I got some folk in here. You know, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, in the highest seat, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, give this man place and thou begin with shame to take the lowest seat. So when you come to a room, uh, don't take the highest seat. Like, you know, sit in the lowest place. Because if somebody else comes that's more honorable than you, they're going to ask you, uh, can you give up your seat? Come on, y'all know how it works. You've been places and, and folks will sit down up there like they were all of that. Then somebody else will come in and say, I'm sorry. You have to he said, verse 10, but when you come, sit down in the lowest room. Take the lowest seat so that when he that bade thee comes, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Then thou shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit and meet with thee. And if, if you go to the lower seat, then the, the master of the house will say, Come on up a little higher. And folk now will look at you with respect. Yeah. Some folk walk in and they just think they just stuff right away. And if you haven't highlighted this in your Bible, you might want to highlight this or underline verse 11. For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. There's another scripture that says, uh, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Jesus was a master at taking his surrounding circumstances and start teaching kingdom principles. And so he's here at this uh, dinner with his Pharisees. And so now he's teaching again about how you should be and how you should act. Because in God's kingdom, the citizens of God's kingdom are humble people. Well, let me put it to you like this. Uh, in God's house, there are no grand children. That there are no grandchildren, you know. Uh, some folk think because they've been in church for a while that they got some kind of tenure. No, 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 no. The more uh, you get uh, close to God, the closer you get to God, and the more you learn about Him, the more humble you become. Uh, and, and you learn that lesson that Jesus teaches on another occasion that if you want to be great, then you ought to be a servant. If you want to be cheap among people, then you ought to be least. The problem is that we have folk uh, in uh, churches like um, Stop and Go, a uh, missionary Baptist Apostolic uh, Church of God in Christ, that think they are Mr. and Mrs. Stop and Go, uh, missionary Baptist Church of God in Christ. Okay, let, I, I see I confused some of you. Like, this is Second Mount Olive. Some people think they are Mr. Second Mount Olive. And this is second not up. And like we are supposed to pay you some kind of certain uh, uh, homage because you are Mr. and Mrs. Second not up. See, I try not to say our name because 
right away some folks say, well, you know what he was talking about, don't you? Yeah, I'm talking about you. And, and Jesus said, you got your Bible here, don't you? Uh, and if you have the kind of Bible that has a red letter edition, isn't this printed in red to denote that Jesus is speaking? So Jesus said, he that exalts himself shall be brought down. But if you humble yourself, he'll lift you up. Then he said also to the, now, now he was talking to the folk that were, that were at the table and, and the folk that had come to eat. But now he wants to talk to the host. And so verse 12 says, then said he also to them that invited them, that had begged them, if you will, when you make a supper or a dinner, don't just call your friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a, re and a recompense be made thee. You know, some folk, they'll only call folk that they know is in their circle and in their group. And then when you call them, at some point, you know they're going to invite you. And so now you got to do for them what they did for you. Amen. But verse 13 says, but when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be, if you really want to be blessed, Give the folk that, 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 that are disadvantaged, that can't pay you back, that are really in need. Uh, we almost made church uh, a society situation, you know, where we only want certain kind of folk in our church. There was a church here in the city of Chicago at one time it was said. No, I said it was said. That if you didn't have a, a, a luxury car or a nice looking car, they didn't want your car in the parking lot. Amen. It cast a bad image on their church. <laughs> and that's against what Jesus is teaching here. If you make a feast, if you're able to produce, if you're able to be a blessing, don't just call the folk that are blessed like you are already. Get the folk that can really stand the blessing and can really benefit from what you're able to do. And verse 14, and then you shall be blessed. For they cannot repay you. For thou shalt be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And sometimes uh, we're generous to folk who can pay us back. But if old slow Joe Mo, broke as he can be, you give something to him, you already know he ain't going to pay you back. You, 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 you just know that when you give it to him, you know, even if he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to take care of you later now, I'm going, and you in your back, you ain't going to do that. So some of y'all say, man, you got some family members like that. Right now, you think about some cousins, uh, some nieces, or nephews, or maybe your child. Don't worry, mama, I'm going to give it back to you, and you already know, baby, I'm going to give it to you because I love you because I know you ain't paying me back. Oh, I get it. Some of y'all ain't saying amen to y'all the ones. That's I'm sorry, I'm on your pew again. Jesus says, be a blessing to those who can't pay you back. And, but, but do it for the right reason, because they need to be blessed. And, and, and God has blessed you, and you have an attitude and a heart and a compassion to bless them. And if you do that, even if you don't get it down here, you will be rewarded. In heaven. Now, when one of and, and, and now we pick up in verse fifteen, because when one of the folk that was sitting at the table heard that, uh, and, and 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 so you got a better understanding now as we read. And when he, one of them that sat at me at the dinner uh, with him heard these things with Jesus, that him is Jesus, heard these things. He, the one that was sitting at the dinner, said unto him, that is Jesus, and, and, and he's thinking that Jesus is only talking about those folk right there that are at the table, the privileged, and the folk that already have. He said, oh man, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Thinking that it's only him and them, and really in his mind, even only the Jews. 
Because at this time, they were of the mindset that salvation would be just for the Jews. And Jesus takes the opportunity to tell a story. Tell, tell, to tell a story. And so he says, and a certain man, I mean, it's almost like, if, if I can improvise a little bit, I, it's almost like he said, I'm glad you said that. Amen. Or, I heard what you said. Let me tell your story. And he wasn't just talking to him, although it says that he said to him, but it was for all the folk that were at the table. He says, a certain man made a great supper. And uh, verse 15 says, and bade many. If you don't know by now, bade is the antiquated word for invite. And invited many. Uh, in, in Jesus' day, the custom of the day was when you were going to have a great supper, Sister Lewis, you would first invite folk to come. And you would say, listen here now, on March 23rd, we're going to have a great feast, and I'm inviting you to come. And I want you to be a part. And they accepted the invitation. All right, we'll be there. March 23rd, I'm writing it down. We'll be there. So he made a great supper and invited many. Now, uh, verse 17 says, now supper is ready. And, uh, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, that were invited. I've already sent out the invitations. Now go and get those folk that I invited. Go and tell them, come now, for all things are now ready. Amen. Jesus had a way uh, so that I can uh, help you truly understand what he's saying. Jesus had a way of talking to the children of Israel yeah. and to God's elect to, uh, to show them their errors uh, as far as their mindset for salvation. In other words, they thought one way, but Jesus had to teach them another way. And, and, and he did it through parables. And, and so he said to them, uh, the master said, to all that were bidden, come on now, all things are ready. Then, verse 18, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. Now, I have to say this so that you will understand that I'm talking about you. But I ain't talking about you. Amen. Uh, you know, this is one, I'm sorry. Well, no, I'm not. Uh, this is one of those sermons that I'm on your view and I'm talking about you. But I'm not trying to single you out. So you might want to say amen and, and help each other to say amen. Because I'm talking about you, but I ain't talking about you. If it make you feel better, I'm talking about us. But I ain't talking about us. The Bible says, and with one consent, they had gotten together. Did Giles invite you to come to the afternoon? I mean, no. Did, uh, did he invite you to come to dinner? Yeah, he invited me. He invited you too? Yeah. Are you going? No, oh, I really don't feel like it. <laughs> Maybe, you know, I already made some other plans. I know I told him that I was coming, but I already made some other plans. So, you know, there's something else going on, and I, I think I'm gonna skip this one this time. You know, you know, I'm sure he'll understand. You know, okay, all right. Well, you know, he he, he gonna be coming now. He's coming, so uh, you know, and, and and I was there with you because you know he's gonna have that look on his face because he invited you to come and you said you was coming. I know I said I was coming too, but you know, he'll just have to understand because I, I, I'm just going to come up with an excuse. That's okay because the spirit had already told me that by the time I got to this part, it was going to get real quiet in the same time. It's all right, it's all right. I know you're listening. Because they came up with an alibi. They came up with what they thought was good rationale. They came up with an excuse. And, and you ain't got to take my word for it. No, you know, look, the Bible says, uh, and they consented with, the, with all with one consent, began to make excuses. And, and that's usually what happens with the Bible when you try to get out of something. You know, if it's legitimate, you don't have to make an excuse. It'll just be there. But a lot of times we have to make an excuse. 
Amen. 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 I was going to sit the choir down because I wanted to see their faces too. <laughs> you see how they look? And, and you are my witness. You see how they look, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The invitation was extended. The invitees accepted. And now the supper is ready. And they all have an excuse. God said, here it is. And this is what's going to happen. And this is what I want you to do. And you say, I will. I'm going to serve you to the balance of my day. I'm going to stick with it to see what the end Go be. And Jesus says, All right, now I need you to come right now. Well, you see, what had happened was, because all with one to say, you can get mad if you want to, but it's in the Bible right here. Wait a minute now. Praise God. I told you one of my members bought me some reading glasses, and I need one here at the church so I can see. And, and they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. And think of Baron uh, has a saying uh, that I remember. Uh, he always says, excuses are only good for the ones who make them. Come on now. So some of y'all take this a little too personal. Let me help you out. Sisters, can I get some amens from you? When that brother says that he loves you, and that, he, uh, that you're the only one in his life, and, and that you are his main priority, but every time you call him, he has an excuse. Does it work for you? And it may work the first or the second time, but then afterwards, he keeps making it. Does it work for you? Oh, come on now. I'm, I'm talking to a congregation of black women. Y'all want to sit there like you don't know what I'm talking about? I know you are great because it's taking all of God in you. Or it ain't even God. It's taking all of whatever it is in you not to rub it in. Just at the thought. No, honey. Not me. Even some of the older men. They may not be able to rub that neck the way they used to, but they hate it. Because you ain't gonna put up with any excuses. Not if you got any sense. Amen. Some of your heads have been bumped enough, so you do take it all the time. But we praying for you. He just tell you anything. All right, baby. Okay. All right. I understand. You need an old one to come to you. Go. They all, with one consent, and, and think about it, that tells me they conspire with each other. And, 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 and some of y'all are smiling because you know, and, and I'm trying to bring it home because, uh, and, and I'm just using the church as an example because that's what happens in church. We, we have a bulletin, and we know all the events that are going on, and you know where you're expected to be. But there's always an excuse except when it's your mission or your ministry if it's your ministry ain't no excuse I gotta be there but when it ain't your ministry there is an excuse and you know what's funny Chrissy we get mad at the folk who ain't here for our ministry but we don't understand they feel the same way when we ain't there for them you can understand how I feel as a pastor. I want people to be everywhere all the time. So when I say, come on and go with me, and somehow some people got the idea that when I say come with me, I'm just looking for a representation of your group. And I know we all can go, let's just send a representative. You a lie. Excuse. 
Okay, let me stick with I see. I, I know. There's some toes now. <laughs> oh, I ain't sorry about saying it. I'm just telling you, you know. <laughs> and they all with one, one consent begin to make excuses. Come on, get back in the Bible so I can get your amen again. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. That's, that's the first excuse. You know, I, I, I bought some land and I need to go and check it out. The problem with excuses is most of the time they fall apart. And here's a brother who was invited sometime earlier, Brother Clyde, to go to the dinner and he knew about it. And now the, the man is saying, come on, it's dinner time. And usually supper is in the evening. He had all day to go and look at the land. And now at dinner time in the evening when the sun has gone down and you can't see the land anyway. Excuses. I will come back this afternoon, but you know, it's getting dark. And I don't be out in the dark. You're alive. You just don't want to come back to church in the dark. But you go everywhere else in the dark. Because it's dark after work when you go to the grocery store and you go to the cleaner and you go get your cigarettes and your lottery ticket. It's dark. And the darkness don't stop you. Excuses. I see the way y'all looking at me. But that was his excuse. Say, so I, I bought some land, and, and 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 so I need to go and see my land. Have them excuse me. You know, in school, when you didn't come to school, when I was growing up, when you didn't go to school, you had to have a a note. An excuse note. You know, please excuse Ken for not being at school yesterday. He was at home sick. Amen. You had to have an excuse. And, and, and some of us treat God as if we can go and write a note and send it up to God. Please excuse Brother Sycamore for not coming to Bible class. He was not feeling well after having worked all day and gone and done all the other errands that he had to do and picking up uh, boot, uh, and then dropping off Bay Cooney and <laughs> and God is going to say okay that's alright can I fix it <laughs> and so first man said I bought some ground I got to hurry up and I must needs go and see it I pray thee have me excused and then another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. And I go to prove them, go to test them, take a look at them. I pray you have me excused. Uh, I'm not a real business kind of person, but I do have enough sense to know that I'm going to look at something before I buy. I bought five yoke of oxen. You mean to tell me you bought five animals sight unseen? <laughs> and it's still evening, but you ain't gonna see them as well in the daytime as you see them in the nighttime. Some folk concerned with the worldly things. That's example one. Some folk are concerned with their personal gain. That's number two. And then some folk, we use other folk as an excuse. Because the other one's saying, that, you know, they're going to eat that up, all up. You know, bad ground and, and bad oxygen. He ain't, ain't going to accept that, but I got a good excuse. I just got mad. Yeah, I just got mad. Tell them! Uh, please tell them that uh, I got married. And, and my wife don't let me stay out at 
tonight? Because a happy wife is a happy house. I go home and I'm eating supper with you and she's already cooked. I got to hear it. I got two amens from the brother, none the wise. I can understand that, Reverend. Because some people use our relationship with others to hinder our relationship with God. And especially, you know, I can say, especially when it comes to children. We use our children as an excuse and we put our children before God. I got news for you. If you haven't heard about now, let me help you with something. Your children are temporary relationships. And, and, and can I say that especially to you if you are married, your children are temporary relationships. I've seen so many marriages messed up because either the father or the mother put all their stock and all their effort and all their energy into the children and not into one another. And why do you say that, Pastor? Because the Bible says that when a man and a woman gets married, the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one. Now they're supposed to stay together until they die. But your children, they grow up and you train them and they leave. And what happens? You don't put all your energy in your children and now and children today, I don't care how much you do for them, they will get up and leave you. Now they are gone and you put all your energy in the children and now the children are gone and it's just you and your spouse and you looking over at the pillow and thinks you going for you. <laughs> because you have not put in the proper energy and effort for your marriage. Children are supposed to leave the house at some point. Kids, hear what I'm saying? Not just when you get mad. I can't wait till I get out of here because I'm so tired of my mom and my daddy all up in my face and all up in my ear. Well, let that be incentive to get up and grow and, and get grown and get your own job and be able to take care of yourself and buy your own property or buy your own house and buy your own car and pay for your own insurance and buy your own clothes and buy your own groceries and have your own job and have your own money and have your own man and have your own woman and the man for the woman and the woman for the man because I ain't talking about that other stuff because gold is gone. That's when you know you're wrong, when you can get out of the house and take care of yourself. That's really another sermon. I just had to throw that in. We use excuses to, uh, with our relationship with others, we use that as an excuse to not be with God and not be in obedience to God. And not have a relationship with God. And I'm not saying you should love your family and you should love folk, but the greatest love you should have should be for the Lord. Amen. And not for the folk that the Lord gave you. Amen. 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 We'll use that as an excuse in a minute. I, I, I will come back, but I got to take my kids home because, you know, they got to get ready for school tomorrow. And most of the time, when you take your kids home, they up for the rest of the evening. They're running around the house. That's if you haven't taken them out to eat. It's not like they're going to bed. It's not like you're taking them home so in a couple of hours they can lay down and go to sleep or anything like that. For the rest of the day, they're just running around the house getting on your nerve. I wish I'd go and sit down somewhere where maybe if you brought them back to church, uh, they would be inspired and they would be encouraged and they would learn more about the Lord instead of you sending them home so they can watch reruns of Nickelodeon or Nick at Night or whatever movies you all are doing. So bring them back to church. The problem is you have used them as an excuse so you don't have to come back. Yeah, I said It just so happens, Dick Earth, that there's no afternoon program this afternoon. Yeah. So I say, yeah.
because we use excuses. Let me throw in a couple of other excuses now that I'm on this since y'all ain't saying amen. This is another excuse that we use. You know, well, you know, I'm just tired. Just tired. You know, I'm just, I've been in morning service. I'm just tired. Tired of what? Tired from what? How much energy do you expend in service? How much energy does it take right now? For some of you, the energy is being used to stay awake. <laughs> but how do you get too tired to serve the Lord, but not too tired to do anything else? God says, come on back. Because I want to see you again, and I want to hear your praise, and I want to hear your gratitude, and I want to hear the Lord, I will come, but I'm just too tired. Now, I've already been here, uh, at, 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 and, and most of you can't say 11 o'clock. I've already been here after 11. <laughs> I'm too tired to come back, you know. And, and, and for you older folk who grew up in church, and you grew up going uh, to more than one service on a Sunday afternoon. What kind of example are you teaching to the younger crowd right now? Uh, when, you, when you grew up and you would go, and, and some of you tell us, honey, uh, and, and at the morning service, we would stick around and we would eat and listen to music, and then we come back for afternoon service, and then after afternoon service, we go over to St. Mel, and then we go over to St. Lucie, and then we go over to the original Mountain High, and we go and have service over there, and it'd be after 10 o'clock before we come back, and we you know, had a good time. And now you act like you're so old and you can't move back to service and after the end of the tell you wouldn't want to go home in your rocking chair and spit snuff. <laughs> Excuses! There's some folk in church I can tell you right now, and I can argue with you. I mean, stop down, argue with you that after 3:30 every Sunday in this church, the walls turn purple and the pews turn white. <laughs> and you would know because you never come back. <laughs> Honey, I don't know what goes on after that because when Reverend finally get a benediction on Sunday morning, I'll be gone and I don't ever come back. Unless, of course, that's my ministry, then I have to come back. <laughs> Excuses. Now, let me help you because some of you, I can tell right now um, that you're trying to formulate an excuse for not saying amen, but let me help you. <laughs> I've used this example before. Maybe this will help you right now. Suppose God used the same excuse for you that you use for him. Suppose God said, all right, it's 1.30, and business has been given, I'm gone, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> but look, I need you now, you know, I need you every, oh, no, well, you know, hey, I've already spent enough time with you, I mean, you know, when, when you finally showed up at 11, after 11, this this one thing, the pastor gave the benediction. I gave him something to say. I didn't know he was going to talk that long, but okay, the service is over now. And so I'm gone, you know. I got things to do. I got people to see. I got to go take care of some of my children because they need to do their homework because I didn't have them do it over the weekend, you know, on Saturday or Friday night or all day Saturday. And so I'm going to take them home so they can do their homework. Me and my friends, we always meet after Sunday. Every day after, every Sunday after Sunday, we after service, we go, we meet, and we have dinner. And now we go out too far. I be going too far, so I just can't get back. So I don't even try to get back to the church because I know by the time I get out there and I sit with my friends, and then it's time for service, I'm gonna be too tired, and I'm just not gonna feel like I don't come back. And so, let's suppose God said, we know after I leave you, I go and I hang out with my son, and we go to other places, and we're having a good time. And by the time you all get ready to start serving, I'm still sitting with my son, and it's so good, I don't feel. I'm like coming back, so y'all go ahead and I'll just meet you next Sunday. Right. 
I mean, you know, because they serve so much food at big offices, and so I get sleepy after I eat. You know, and they have specials at Denny's, and so we have coupons, and so we get a lot of food over there. And down there at Sally's and Mary's and what have you, you know, I'll be with my friends, and so I'm just not coming back now, you know. And plus, I want to save my gas because I'm not have to go to work or during the week, so I'm just not coming back. And just some of you, I just love you, I just ain't coming back. <laughs> And how does God feel about this? I'm almost done. How does God feel about this? The Bible says they made an excuse. One said, I just bought some ground. Another said that uh, I just bought some oxen. Another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. And God blessed the servant. And look what the servant it says. Verse 21, so the servant came and showed his Lord these things. He didn't add anything to it. He didn't take anything away. He just said, here it is. Lord, this is what they said. And the Bible says, then the master of the house being angry because he was tired of their excuses. If you're not getting anything out of this sermon, let me tell you, God is tired of your excuses. You're not taking anything away from this. God is tired of your alibis. Don't, al alibis don't work. And excuses don't work with God. Moses tried to make excuses with God. God said, Moses, I want you to go down to the, uh, Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses had all kinds of excuses. I, I, I don't know how to talk. Uh, I, I don't know who you are. Uh, They're going to ask me. I don't know what to say. Uh, I don't know if I can go by myself. God said, I want to put Moses. I made you. I gave you your time. If I tell you to go, then you need to go. Gideon, thou mighty man of valor, God is giving you victory over the midnight. Well, who am I, Lord? I'm just a poor man, and my dad is poor, and I don't have an idiot. I ain't ask you that. I'm not looking for your excuse. We'll come back, but I got this to do, and I just had death in the family, and my family's still mourning. Oh, that's the other one. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and I got company over. <laughs> And I got some relatives at the house, so I can't come right now because I got to deal with my relatives. Well, if you're any kind of child of God, you ought to tell them on Sunday, I go to church. Now, if you're coming to my house, come on to church with me. If you don't want to come, then I'll see you when I get back. But on Sunday, I give God praise because God is not going to accept your excuse. I needed you to be at church Sunday because you were going to sit down and I was bringing somebody that was going to sit down next to you that was going to need your encouragement and need your amen. But they came and the people empty next to them because you decided that after all day Saturday and all your Saturday night activities, you were too tired. After I walked you on anyway, you were too tired to come to church and give me some praise. And that person was left hanging because you didn't show up. God is saying, I'm sick of your excuses. How are your excuses? I will come. I just don't like that Negro up there. <laughs> Sick of pastor. I wish he let some of them other preachers preach sometime. I get tired of his mouth. I'm just going to tell you the truth. I, you never tell me. I wish you would. But you know, I'm just tired of his mouth. I'm tired of what he got to say. <laughs> Especially when he's saying like I'm saying it right now. It just ain't no cause for that. You know, you just ought to go on and preach the word. <laughs> like you listening in the first place. <laughs> Excuse me. I promise you, when you stand in front of God, God is not going to say, uh, How come you didn't do this? And when you say, Because Pastor made me mad, and Pastor got on my nerve, and Pastor didn't come and see me, and Pastor didn't give me any counseling, and Pastor didn't call my name, and he'll say, And Pastor didn't give you light, and Pastor didn't wake you up, and Pastor didn't answer your prayer, and Pastor wasn't a blessing like I was a blessing. And so Jesus said that when the master heard these excuses, he was angry. And the listeners were understanding that Jesus was also saying that God had already given an invitation to the Jews to accept salvation in their heart. He had already told them that I was going to send the Messiah to come. 
and he was going to bring salvation. And now the Messiah is here and you come up with excuses why you shouldn't accept him. And so in his anger, he said, that's all right. There's some other folk I can invite. You think you the stuff? You think you the end of it all? You think that if you don't get it, nobody else will? There's somebody else out there that would gladly take what you are rejecting. Sitting here like God owes you something. Sitting here like God is supposed to bring you here. Sitting here like God ought to be glad that you made your presence in this place. God is there. I got some other folk out there who are glad to come when you don't come. There are some folks who think if you don't come to the dinner, dinner's going to be canceled. Fool. I wish you wouldn't show up. I wish you would think you really Mr. and Mrs. Mount Out. And then God let you die. Yeah. I bet you will have service next Sunday. Yeah. I bet you there'll be Bible class on Wednesday. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. Jesus said to his servant, that's all right. Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the maimed and the whole and the blind. God has given you an opportunity to receive the blessing first. But if you don't want to receive it, there's some other folk out there. And not only that, but Jesus said this specifically. He said, bring in the poor and bring in the maimed and those that are paralyzed and those that are blind because you excluded them from this dinner. But I want you to know that God accepts everybody. Even though they're not in your circle. Everybody in God's circle, even though they don't hang out in your clique, they are always in God's clique. And so he said, that's all right. I gave them a chance. I gave them an opportunity. And they act like they were all of that, when in fact they are none of that. But I got some folk out there. You see, that's how churches grow. When you evangelize the gospel of Jesus Christ and they come in and accept his word and then some of us who have been in church for a long time we think that because they're just getting in that God won't invite them to the table but I got news for you the next prostitute that walks in could be the next president of the mission group the next drug dealer that gives his life to Christ to in fact be the next chairman of the deacon board, the next skeezer that walked down the middle aisle just might be giving leadership to the choir because although you are rejecting them, God said, go out into the street and the lane and go out and invite the folk that nobody wants to be bothered with. And I'm so mad that I was in that group that nobody wanted to be bothered with. But my father in heaven said, that's all right, I love you. And you can come on anyway. And the good thing about God's blessing is that there's so much of it. Because the Bible says that when they went out and got the poor, and they got the maimed and the halt, and they got the blind and the disadvantaged, and those that were handicapped and disabled, the Bible said there was still room for other folks to come in. And so they said, go out in the hedges and the highways, in the hedges and the highways, were the castaways, were the folks that were kicked out, were the people that were all outside of society. See, the poor and the maimed, they were still in society, but they were the higher echelon. But God said, go in the hedges and the highways, and go to the folk on the ski road, and go to the folk on the road street, and go to those people out on Madison, and invite them in, because your excuse is going to block your blessings, and your excuse is going to make you to that manage. God is not accepting any excuses. God is not all of my alibis. God of my cater. Can I help somebody? Let me help you today. You can 
could get better right now. Because God don't take excuses. And so this looks like a good crowd to work some remedies with. Why are you just sitting there? Why are you silent? Why won't you respond to the word of God? What's your excuse? <laughs> What's your alibi? I just told you that God does not like excuses. And if you're sitting there and you got nothing to say, I'm here to tell you what the Spirit says. So when you let me read it for us, she said, enter into my courts with praises. Come in with thanksgiving. If you don't have a praise, you don't have an attitude of thanksgiving. What's your excuse? Now let me help you. If you don't want to say it out loud, say it in your mind. Let me start the sentence for you. My excuse is, and then give your excuse. And I am willing to believe that when you give your excuse, you know for yourself it ain't a good excuse. It's not a valid excuse. I'm not saying amen because I don't really always say amen. I'm not saying hallelujah because that's not my style. I'm not waving in my hand. I don't like him when he came in, and I don't like him when he sit down. But wait just a minute, you ain't saying amen to me. You want to say amen to the Lord. You got to wave your hand to me. You want to wave it unto God. That's what they call a wave offering. You're not lifting your hands to me. You want to lift it up to God. What is your excuse? What is your alibi? How come you can't give God praise? Hasn't he been good to you? Did he wake you up this morning? Hasn't he after your prayer? Has he made a way for you? Has he healed your body? Did he watch over you all this time? Hasn't God been good? Then what's your excuse? The seed is ready. Excuses, and you're 
and you sat in front of the TV and you thought that the TV was more important you have because I gave you and you're not sick and you're not pain and you're not in trouble in other words you have not because I blessed you but you know the haves and the have nots was more important than talk to me and study my word your name is on the wire and they are talking about you if it wasn't for me you be in a scandal, but instead of coming and talking to me, you know that your pope was more important than I am. And so my reason of not messing you up is because I'm not a priority in your life. If anybody can come up with a reason, God can. But I'm so glad. Look beyond my thoughts. I'm so glad that in spite of myself, I'm so glad that through my shortcomings, my fault and my failures, he keeps on blessing me over and over and over again. What's your excuse? For not being all that you should be. What's your excuse for being more than just a bitch member? What's your excuse for tending God and not giving your tithes and offerings? What's your excuse for not doing all that God has blessed you to do? God is. Let me emphasize. God is. You know, I have my issues. But I'm going to say ground by saying God is sick of your excuses. God is tired of your alibis. God is fed with your reasons and rationalizations. Some of us have been in church all our lives and we can come up with more excuses than sermons we've heard. And God is sick of it. You ought to take stock in your life. You ought to take a look at yourself right now. Don't look at your neighbor because you can come up with a list for your neighbor. But take a look at yourself. And when you look at yourself, look in the mirror. But don't use my mirror. Because another excuse is, I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as her. I have my faults. But I ain't nothing like him. Yeah, when you compare yourself to somebody else, you always gonna look good. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. So if you look at me, oh, you're gonna look like a star if you look next to me. But if you look in God's mirror and compare yourself to God's mirror, then perhaps you'll learn that there are no excuses that God will tolerate. Take a look at yourself. You ain't got to say it out loud. Take a look at yourself. What excuse have you come up with? What's been your riding alibi? Men used to say jokingly at work, man, some women just get away with stuff. They can call off and say they got woman problems. And that's always an excuse. Can't nobody say nothing because it's a woman problem. And they use that as their riding alibi, their go to excuse. Come on, sister, you can say it, man. I can say it with you. And some of us have that kind of excuse for church, and we have that kind of excuse for God. We always go to that one excuse, we always go to that one alibi. I would come, but I don't have a way, I don't have a ride. So does that mean you stay home seven days a week and that you never go anywhere? Somehow you find a way to get to the grocery store. You find a way to get to the currency exchange. You find a way to get to the lottery line. Can't you find a way to get to church? Excuses. Excuses. We tip God. I just don't have the money to give right now. Really? 
And someone gave you that suit? And that new hat? Your shoes don't look like they came from Payless. How you gonna drive up in church in a brand new car and tell God you broke? Your purse is Louis Vuitton. What's the other one, D&G? Thank you, sister. Dolce and Gabbani. I just didn't want to pronounce it wrong. Hey, man, you got a $200 person, $2 in your pocket. Excuses! And God is sick of your excuses. Amen. I will get into ministry, but I don't like the people that's in there. Excuses. And excuses are only good for the folk that make them. I will stand up. I'm just too tired. Excuses. Because you're going to go everywhere else. And some of us will go with our walker. Because <laughs> we want to get there. But we'll use excuses for the church. Come on, talk to me now. I know you don't like what I'm saying. I know it's kind of hard to swallow. But God wants you to know that he's sick of your excuses. I've been in for many years. So it's time for somebody else. Suppose God said, well, you've been living for many years. So you don't have to get up in the morning. Excuses. And I love you. I'm done. I love you. I look at some of you, and there's some of you in favor network land. This is a part of your church, too. Amen. I love some of you. Some of you think that your frankness and your candor will work with God. I'll end it on this. So, Sabara, some folk will look you in the eye and say, I'm just not coming. Amen. I'm just not coming. I don't go back in the afternoon. I just don't come. And you think because you're telling the truth, that's all right with God? Like the judge is going to say, sir, you've been accused of committing this crime. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to tell you the truth. I killed him. <laughs> yeah, I shot him. I shot the sheriff. But I didn't shoot the deputy. And what do you think the judge is going to say? Well, you know what, man? See, most people come into the courtroom and they just lie, and they just have all kind of alibis and everything, but at least you told me the truth. And since you told me the truth and you did shoot that man, go home. It ain't gonna happen. And so for some of you, and especially, I love you, some of you older folk who look me in the eye and say, Reverend, I'm just not coming. Y'all ain't looking at me now. Y'all look at me and say, Reverend, I'm just not coming. You think God is happy with your excuse? I can come to your house and drag you out. And I wouldn't want to do it. Because I don't want to be with any Negro that don't want to be with me. Amen. You know, it works for me too. I can be bad by myself. But I'm not the one. God is the one that you have to be accountable for. And so, no more excuses. No more excuses. No more excuses. Can you tell yourself? No, man, no more excuses. I committed myself this Lent season to give up French fries and Coca Cola. Now, no, let me help you now. Let me help you. I, I'm telling you that because saying it out loud will commit me more to doing what I said I was going to do. Some people make resolutions of New Year's, but they never say it. Because if you tell somebody, I'm going to lose 15 pounds, now you feel committed because they're looking at you to see if you're going to lose those 15 pounds. And so some of you said to yourself, no more excuses, and you're glad because you said it to yourself. And so if you come up with another excuse, nobody will know that you have said that to yourself. Now let me challenge you to look at somebody and tell them from this point forward, no more excuses. Wow, wow. I gotta hand it to you for your honesty. Some people just look right at me and say nothing. 
Come on, look at your neighbor. Don't you want to be better? Don't you want to make God happy? Remember the scripture says, and the master got angry because of the excuses. God got angry at Moses because he was making excuses. Go ahead, look at your neighbor. Look at your ministry leader and tell them, uh, look at your ministry partner. Look at the person next to you. Come on, Deacons, you need to look at each other. Come on, choir members. I have nobody on way tonight for the choir. Come on, look at one another and say, no more excuses. Thank you, Jesus. I heard someone say, I want to get my life together. I promise you this is my last one. Some of you, that's your excuse. I want to get better. I want to do better. But I want to get my life together first. You can't get your life together. If you could get your life together, you would never need Jesus. But he came because we could not get our lives together. So stop using that as an excuse. The invitation will be split on that note. The door of the church is open. No more excuses. God has been good to you. You know you need to be in church or get back in church. Won't you come now? No more excuses. No more alibis. No more giving God some rationale. That you know don't work for God anyway. Won't you come? Do it today. God's been good to you. And He wants to be in your life. But you gotta stop making excuses. Won't you come? If they want young, old, it does not matter. Young people as well as old people. God does not accept the excuses. Won't you come? Do it today. Do it right now. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Those that are late into this broadcast, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died for your sin and rose again, and you can accept him in your heart as your Lord and Savior, you too can be saved. Don't make any more excuses. Come to Jesus now. Come to Christ right now. Do it today. Stop making excuses. I bet you bad. I've been out there. You don't know the kind of stuff I've been doing. God already knows what you're doing and you're still here. He woke you up. Come on today. Do it right now. Somebody in this room needs to make that decision. Do it today. Is there one? Is there one? Do it today. You just made a promise out loud. You said no more excuses. Come on, stop making excuses. Come right now. Do it right now. Can we say that without sound? Praise God. I see one coming. I'm going to say out loud that when I die, in my home board service, get your car around. Don't sing no song like y'all singing it right now. Amen. I'm not just talking about the crowd, I'm talking about all of them. If you want to invite somebody to Christ, take it like you mean it. Take it like you want somebody. Stop making excuses. This is just invitation. You know what I'm saying? Come on. If we call for Christ, let's say it like you mean it. Come on now. Let's ask it one more time. Won't you come? Is there one here? I'm taking all this time so you can get rid of all your excuses and come on down. Come on now, say it like you mean it. Oh, if you've been anything to you, say it like you mean it. No excuses, no excuses. I'll wait till next Sunday. I didn't plan to join the day, so I'll just wait till next Sunday. Next Sunday, I promise to you, you need to come right now. You need to do it at the old folks get by the blood. There's still money warm in your way. Come on. Bless you, you may be seated. God bless you, please appreciate you. Come on, give God some praise in this place. 
Let's pray God for the sinner that's come down tonight. Come on, let's pray God. Let's pray Please stand. Pastor Jalva has Yelva Doris, and she's coming under rest. Come on, praise God. Yelva Doris, God bless you. Restoration means you are lost in the middle of our church, and you're coming back home. Is that correct? Yes. We're glad to have you. Come on, let's welcome our.